it's the hundredth anniversary of Gene Kuhn's birthday here on Trekland Tuesdays Live, number three thirty nine, with me, Doctor Trekler Nimichek, coming at you here from the heart of Trekland, internet willing. <laughs> And Portal 47 and Trekland Treks, all of that for some clarity, sanity, and a bigger picture in all things Star Trek. Hey, everybody, welcome. It's 2024. Happy New Year, everyone. Thank you for joining me here on Tuesday. I just want to remind everybody, too, that up front, that I want to thank our Patreons, our TTL Club. So thank all these good folks for being in on my Patreon. Diana Hopkins, Robin Wilson, Lawrence Todd, Anne-Marie Siegel, Justin Porteous, Galinda Bruton, Chris Jiggins, Pranakasha Productions, Comedy Forecast, and Andrew Jaszymski. And yes, our live wires. That would be Rob McLean, Byron Bailey, J.R. Poole, Halbert Gunjansson, Alan Hoenzi, Dave Gregory, Tobias Rex, Donna S. Runyon, and Casey Shafsky. Thanks to all those folks for being in on our Patreon. Yes, and thanks to all of you for being here, where still our gift special is still up. If Santa did not get you your Christmas gift, or you've got some Trek folks still on your list, we've got the six months for five, or even the 12 for $10. Just go to LarryNimacek.com. It's still there. It's the Did Santa Leave You Off His Trek Christmas List offer, and it's all there. Or, of course, just jump in Portal 47 when you can, okay? And, of course, if you're thinking about coming to L.A. here sometime in the near soon, you want to have a special, unique away mission that you create with my help, and then I will lead you a Trekland Trek of your very own for filming location sites around greater Los Angeles. We'll have lunch. I'll be your chauffeur your escort and your cosplay and prop wrangler, whatever it is you need to have one of the most exciting and unique experiences you can do different than a con or even a cruise. The set tour in Ticonderoga is awesome, but the outdoor sets. Yeah. When you get off the soundstage, that's amazing. All that to say, it's an exciting year. It is a new exciting year, but look, uh, on my e-news list, and if you're not, LarryNimacek.com, go sign up. I have some fun stuff there. We have announcements of what I'm doing. I talk about what's going on in the news. And most of all, I always try to have something fun for everybody, a picture, an image, and if nothing else, a poll. And we've been doing a lot of these lately. This New Year's mood, I was asking everybody, I've done this before, what are you most excited about coming up in 2024? in Trekland, in the world of Star Trek. Now, some things we know Starfleet Academy won't be until 2025. I didn't ask that. I'm talking calendar year 2024. Section 31, the movie is iffy. We don't know if it'll be end of the year or into next year. So I went ahead and included it. I had a list of eight options, including, yes, some all of the above. And here's what happened. I had a very good turnout on this. People must have been a lot, uh, a lot more time on their hands before New Year's than before Christmas, which is not surprising, right? A lot more reflective time around New Year's. So here's, you know, it's kind of the expected, all the projects, and then some, some group answers. So here's what, I actually had a three-way tie for the last place, so the lowest answering. Uh, everybody answered on something. Nothing had no votes. So... 5.9% of those responding, which was about, it looks about like 4% of my news list got back to me on this. Uh, so with 5.9%, okay, people, uh, pe some people said the coming of Section 31 movie. Okay, fine. We're assuming that this year. 5.9%, uh, another sliver said new toys and merch is the most exciting thing they're excited for of everything in Star Trek, which is cool, which is fine. And another sliver, 5.9% said, that Star Trek IV movie of some kind, maybe, or at least getting word about what it might be, having something start by the end of the year. Um, that was interesting, but everything did get some votes, which is cool, out of my, out of my list, right? Not scientific, but there you go. Now, the next biggest jump was 8.8%. This is a little surprising. The next bunch said 
the next prodigy season season two now on netflix they are most excited about that nearly nine percent eight point eight percent okay the next biggest chunk if cadet alice was here i think she'd be disappointed but you know she's a little skewed that way <laughs> we're getting her slowly caught up on the other treks uh the next biggest chunk though 14.7 percent nearly 15 percent said no no everything they're just excited about everything okay that's understandable i was always i always hated making specific choices that's an easy one to do the next chunk of folks responding 16.2 percent said the coming of lower decks new season season five which we know will be out around august which mike mcmahon told me on trek files if you saw that listen to it uh, last week said that as of early mid-december he was just putting the finishing touches on the finale of season five so it's sitting there ready to go okay that was 16.2 percent of my list that responded said that the next chunk 19.1 percent said without getting elaborate about it uh not just one but more than one of these now we didn't break down into are you excited for lower decks and prodigy are you excited for the right because remember, there's only three things we know of happening for sure. We know that season two of Netflix, Prodigy. We know Lower Dex's new season, season five. And we know the final season of Discovery, season five, will be out. Maybe section 31. Everything else is bumped, right? Strange New Worlds will likely be into 2025 since they just started filming. So where does that leave us? Where did I leave you? I said 19.1% said more than one of these. Here's what's a surprising amount. The biggest single chunk, 23.5%. Nearly a quarter of my mail list said the thing they're most excited for this year is the final season of Discovery. I know. I Well, good. Uh, okay. Yay. <laughs> that was a little surprising. But there you go. Of course, we had other, again, we had other things that, that said all of them or more than one. When you consider that, if you think of the all of them or at least more than one, well, that's 33%. That's a third. So a lot of broad mindedness in this poll. There you go. That's what our readers got back to me about. Uh, look, if you're not on my list, you can go to larrynemichek.com and get on and get keep getting news and bits and cool things that i'm offering in truck world uh what's going on with the podcasts and some highlights i had a new year's eve message where i, I when i was looking back at some of the best of trekland tuesdays live which tend to just be done one and done forgotten about but i had some really proud moments this year led by my sixth anniversary show and having bill wolkoff one week into the writer strike on with us live from the picket line back when most of fandom was going now what now what a strike was trying to keep everybody up on the issues ahead of time because we saw it coming late but it saw it coming and by the end of it the whole world was all into the strike there was so much fan support from the 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 strike support line the picket uh, support line to all the all the podcasters and youtubers were actively helping and explaining the issues and that was cool in the beginning, there was one. <laughs> there was that. Here's the thing. Um, two years ago, two years ago, three years ago, I can't believe it. 2021. Big hoopla about the 100th anniversary. You know, we love anniversaries. And in America, we love our centennials because we're a young country and so much of our world. That's why the bicentennial, the 200th anniversary of the U.S. in 76 was such a big deal for those of you who go back that far. And considering it was the year before Star Wars, it was the first time we got drowned in stuff. I think merchandise and marketing hit an all-time high with the Bicentennial and just kind of paved the way for the mass marketing of Star Wars. But it started with something that was basically a public, public entity. But we are all up on Centennial's 100 anniversaries. And yes, we had jeans. Uh, we had the 50th. We had the semi-centennial. For Star Trek back in 2016, uh, back in 2016 seems so ancient, right? Gene's Centennial was in 2021. We had a COVID-delayed tour that I got to lead, a life tour for him of his uh, life and growing up and career and family places around LA, which is a hoot. But it's something special we did for his Centennial. A year later, well, we did it at the end of his Centennial year, right? 
because his birthday was August 19th. I want to say August 19th. Well, we have another one uh, pointed out to me just a couple of days ago, and I've noticed the world waking up to this. Now, today is not January 7th, but on January 7th, 1924, a young man in Beatrice, Nebraska was born. And yes, it we're talking, we are talking Gene Kuhn, okay? Um, often called Gene, <laughs> often called Star Trek's other Gene, his full name, just so you know, just like Eugene Wesley Roddenberry, Eugene Lee Kuhn in Beatrice, Nebraska, January 7th, 1924. And just so you know, this is part of the Midwest, everybody. We're talking Beatrice or Beatrice, I've heard some people say, is just over the line from Kansas. So it's like in central Nebraska, south central Nebraska, just over the line and right south of Lincoln. They're all right on US 77, which truth be told, if you went straight down US 77, you would hit go through Kansas, go through Oklahoma. You'd hit Oklahoma City. You'd hit Norman. You would hit Noble. You'd hit Slaughterville. So in a way, it's kind of like Gene Kuhn and I are on the same longitude. But no, that's where he was raised. Talk about the all-American 20s, 30s raising, you know, the greatest generation raise up. At four years old, he sang He sang on the radio in Omaha, W-O-A-W. He knew 24 songs, one in French and one in German, No Hard Feelings from the Great War. He was in the 4-H club of Gage County. And he had been a Boy Scout, figures. Oh, it's just He has this all-American life. He was the son of U.S. Army Sergeant, so his dad was in the Army, Sergeant Merle Jack Pug Coon, and his mother was a decorator, Emma Gay Noakes. Now, in small-town Nebraska, it's interesting that his mom had that kind of a career, but that's where we are. But let me just talk about this. We talk about Gene Coon. Why are we talking about Gene Kuhn? If you're not around, if you haven't been deep diving with us in Trekland or anywhere across Star Trek, Gene Kuhn was basically the number two. These terms in the 60s are hard. Today we talk about showrunner. Well, Gene was the showrunner. He was the executive producer, but he very famously, after he launched the thing, had plenty of ideas, but he won, he was like the think tank leader. And yeah, he'd write, he'd written. Gene had been writing on his own for ages. Gene's dream, Gene Roddenberry's dream, was to get into the business. of. He had written himself raw, getting paid for one-off scripts for ages, not being on staff. He was not on staff of Have Gun, Will Travel. He wrote a ton of shows. His one formal writing award came from one of his scripts for Have Gun, Will Travel, but he wrote all over the place. And if you're listening to the podcast Geneology, our friends Norm and Earl are, are looking at Gene Roddenberry's early writing credits for other shows. That's a Roddenberry podcast you should be paying attention to. Um, I just did a guest cameo. When they, they act out, they have little readings, act outs from some of Gene's early scripts on all of these 50s shows like Highway Patrol and all down the line. Uh, but they're, they're awesome to see because you're seeing seminal Gene, right? Which is what we do on the Trek Files as well. At times we go back and look at some of Gene's uh, early primal works and all that. Well, the dream at the time, as it still is, is not to write one-off scripts for forever. You want to become an editor. You want oh wait, that's publishing. In TV, you want to sell your own show and get the residuals. And you want to get a think tank. You want to get a writer's room together and have a whole production company under you as the executive producer of selling your own show. If not, at least coming in to run somebody else's. But the cream of the crop, the best thing to do is be the creator because then you've got the residuals of the whole show. And assuming it goes on for a while, that's a nice nest egg to always have dribbling in, especially now. In the old days, people saw your show. It was one and done. Now everything lives forever, right, on the cables and now on the streaming channels. There's a little bit of trickling coming in all the time. Gene Roddenberry at the launch of Star Trek needed that person. At the beginning, it was John D.F. Black. Famously wrote The Naked Time, famously rewrote. Just because you don't see their name on scripts does not mean famously that they did not have a hand in it. And sometimes very graciously, if it's a first-time writer 
who needs the credit and the attention. If it's a famous writer who just didn't quite get the script or it's a wacky, tricky show like Star Trek, the showrunner or the head writer will do a page one rewrite. And occasionally the writer, the freelancer will get their nose a little out of shape about it. And in an era when 90% of the scripts were freelanced because writing staffs only had one or two or three people, wasn't a staff room. That was the 60s. By the time of Next Gen, you had a writer's room, but still a healthy dose because they couldn't run write 26 scripts a year. Still a healthy dose of freelancers, which meant you were always taking pitches, which was a whole side industry, a sidebar to the running the show. Today, we have 10 episode seasons and 82 people. I'm kidding. We have so many folks in the writer's room, outside scripts are not a thing. Usually, everybody gets one script a year, maybe two and maybe you're co-writing with people in the room. But back in the day, Gene Roddenberry was already looking to empire build a little bit and he needed help. And aside from give Bob just my heart attack, because yet another script was running late, you needed a script person to churn it out. John DF Black was a little miffed at the way he, he wasn't totally at home. They loved the show, but he did not like the way Gene did page one rewrites on some of his pieces. He was not totally happy and he left the show along with his wife and secretary, Mary. We just recently lost both John D.F. Black and Mary just in the last few years, four or five years separately. But out of the blue coming over was our guy today, Gene Kuhn. And just as a capsule, if you, if you haven't watched enough original series where his name popped up like it used to, Gene came in very famously in the middle, <laughs> forgot that he had read Frederick Brown's story called Arena about a human with a fight with an alien captain. And basically it's the show, it's the story of Arena. Forgot that he had borrowed from that and midway through cranking that out on the run in a record amount of days, one of his traits, uh, Gene Kuhn remembered later on and went back and at, before he found out about otherwise, basically he got Frederick Brown, a lit sci-fi writer's name in it, who was thrilled and nobody ripped anybody off. <laughs> he got credit, he got a payment and all that. But just, no, famously starting with Arena, we're jumping ahead to his time on Star Trek. He had been one of those writers like Gene. Gene Kuhn never got to be a showrunner. Aside from the fact he did get over to the name of the game after Star Trek, but on the way to getting there, he found his way to Star Trek. But even before that, I'm just looking at his IMDb. He wrote, you know, Westerns were all the thing. Plus you had action shows, cop shows, medical shows, Dragnet, Wagon Train, Maverick, Bonanza. He floated the idea of a satirical spinoff of the Donna Reed show, which turned into the Munsters out of everything, right? Before he got his way to that. But just want to say something else too, very important, that um, at that time, he missed World War II serving in the Universal War of World War II, but he had moved with his parents from the Midwest out West, okay? He had two other brothers, Merle Jack and Louise Newell Kuhn. They moved to Glendale, just 10 miles from where I'm sitting right now. He had a younger brother that died at 10 in Beatrice, but his father came out and worked in poultry. And Gene wound up going to school and graduated from Glendale High here in greater LA. Now, he was stateside in the Marines in World War II. Then he went into radio, performed in a production of The Night of January 16th, then went to the University of Iowa. All right. He went back to active duty in the Korean War, but as a reservist, then as a Marine for two years. He was a war reporter, okay, and fought, fought in Korea, a uh, new chesty puller. He came back home, wrote two novels, Meanwhile Back at the Front and The Short End of the Stick, which is about his time in the service. And then he went back into radio news. He ran a pharmacy in Hollywood at Beverly Boulevard and North Ardmore for five years, but that's why he was looking like Gene did about the same time, about the like 1956, the whole burgeoning world of TV was eating up scripts. And that's when he, that's when he went that way. But these are, this is, this is all a part of the world that he brought to his Star Trek writing. 
you'll find a lot of time people who were in war and of the greatest generation where you had Gene Roddenberry, you had Matt Jeffries, our director, you had Gene Kuhn, you had so many of the people who were making Star Trek, Jimmy Doohan, D. Kelly, who had been in the war in service in different capacities, combat and uh, combat adjacent, but knew that, knew the life and death of it and knew that what was, what could be trivial and trifle and what was not and didn't take anything lightly. And that entire generation all small D democratically served because they had to. That was the mindset that brought us to Star Trek and some of the angsty situations that Gene Roddenberry wrote for Kirk and Spock and Scotty and McCoy. And Gene Kuhn was right of that generation too, fit right in. So it's been a privilege though. I'll tell you this, if we don't wind up having Andy in, um, we've had her, I was privileged to have her as a guest twice on the Trek Files. Before the Trek Files and before Portal 47 existed, we had her as a guest in Los Angeles. Andy's a force of nature. She was Gene Kuhn's assistant. She is African-American. She is from, her family's from a historically black town in Texas, Shanklesville. She came out of radio, jazz radio, blues, came to LA, was here for the Watts riots in the early 60s. And the, the, some of the social ripples that came out of the riots there was some, yeah, you might call it diversity hiring, but at least the attempt of all white Hollywood to try to get a little diverse, the beginnings of having the, the, the social justice, the civil rights movement repercussions in media. And yes, Lucy, she would say, she would joke that Lucy and Desi Lou bought, brought in a black woman and a black guy, and she was the black woman, the diversity hires, but she ran the gate, the Gower gate, the main gate, the opening door where people came in and out that she buzzed people through. But Gene Kuhn met her doing that and brought her along as his assistant, which was, I don't want to say it was shocking, but it was part of the new wave. So on one hand, you've got a guy from Nebraska who served in the war, who's a veteran, who ought to have this all American makeup, but there is something about him. He came to LA. There's something about his bent and his philosophy that he's not just following the herd. And even in the sixties, he is open to hiring this because she was smart. Andy was smart and with it, and he could tell she was sharp. And he brought her along as his assistant, not just to not just to fill a quota before quotas were there. No, he knew she had it and he wanted to help her develop her writing and she did. Now she's wound up becoming a storyteller these last four decades, five decades in Australia. But at the time she was not only looking to expand her writing, she was a young quiet one then, but finding her way and nudging Elmo's with all the civil rights leaders at the time. She was Dr. King's driver in LA she will say, I knew Medgar, I knew Malcolm, I knew Martin, and suffered right along with the tragedies of all three of them during the 60s. But part of overlaying that experience is her experience on Star Trek and knowing Jean and Majel and Leonard and Bill, and it's an amazing thing. And most of all, one of the witnesses we have to talk about the most about her old boss, Jean Kuhn. Wonderful to talk about that. She's done that both in her book, her big book is coming out this year in April. She had a special edition just for Star Trek that sold out to 200 copies two years ago at Vegas, at Vegas Trek. But you can catch her online at YouTube with her TED Talk. She talks about Gene Kuhn two ways in Trekland. On my channel, you can find our panel at Vegas, the panel on stage. You can also find the two camera shot film editions of the Trek Files, one of which we especially focus on, on Gene Kuhn. So I'm going to refer you to that as we talk here a little bit about Gene Kuhn. We talk so much about his start. Yes. Created the Klingons for Aaron to Mercy, right? Created the term United Federation of Planets, created the term Starfleet, did some, wrote Metamorphosis, created Zephyrin Cochran. Now it's not like Gene Kuhn was sitting here in 96 going, Let's build a franchise, and I'm going to come up with about half of the foundational elements of it, the other half that Gene Roddenberry didn't come up with. That's not how it evolved. No one knew or cared that Star Trek might be around more than its network run. That was a happy accident. But as it happens, the foundational parts of Star Trek, including the McCoy-Spock banter, including the general injection of humor, 
that some say Gene Roddenberry was not all that thrilled about. But still, I think that's a little overblown. It was really welcomed. The heart of season one through the heart of season two, the classic episodes Gene Kuhn was there for, including helping to rewrite City Hunter Forever. All of these, all of these titles. What's been amazing is, sadly, after he left Star Trek and took Andy with him, just within a few short years, his chain smoking, it was the 60s, his chain smoking caught up with him and the cough that he developed about 1972, 73, quickly turned into a lung cancer. It was not operable. They, his diagnosis was a shock, what he revealed to other people. And in those last four or five years of his life, amazingly, the aspects of his biography, apart from Star Trek, was that Gene Kuhn had wanted to marry Jacqueline Kuhn eventually, but she was married at the time in college and he married basically his number two choice, Joy, Joy Hankins. And they were married all through the 50s and 60s, but then he accidentally ran into Jackie again, found out she was divorced, and just they just reunited, and he couldn't help himself. And he basically uh, divorced his first wife, but set her up, supported her, but he had to go with his first love, which it's a little, a little twisted, but in the end, it's all about true love. Hopefully with a soft landing, the way movies do, you know, I don't know, Sleepless in Seattle. He set Joy up, but by the time he left Star Trek, he was newly married and supporting an ex-wife and working all the time. And yeah, Lee Cronin was his pen name that he, he continued to write for Star Trek, even as he was supposed to be on exclusive contract over at Universal. And that is where he eventually took took Andy over to with him. Uh, it Takes a Thief was the show he was producing and writing on. But he also had scripts after Star Trek on the name of the game. Then came Bronson, The Immortal, The Mod Squad, wrote some for Hard Bennett. Uh, the Virginian, Nichols, which was a James Garner show, it didn't last long. Assignment Vienna, Kung Fu, a story and a teleplay. The Quester Tapes, he helped co-write the Quester Tapes TV pilot. He worked with Gene on that. And then even the streets of San Francisco, he was cranking out scripts because he had to, even as his health was going down and Gene Kuhn died very quickly, very suddenly. It just snowballed 1973 of his lung cancer, took Gene, Bob Justman, the people he'd work with by shock, ended the protege ship, the mentoring of Andy, left his both of his his wife and his, even his former wife just kind of in shock a little bit just shattered and most of all aside from thankfully the remembrances of gene coon say in david gerald's making of tribbles book where he talks about lee cool lee coon so much gene coon so much but we had david to talk about gene coon we have andy my old friend who's passed now russell bates who wrote uh, the only episode that ever won Star Trek a Dramatic Emmy for the animated series. We only have, it's been so long and he passed so soon before even the motion picture and the re-blooming of Star Trek, the Rathacon, the coming of Next Generation, the building of a franchise. Gene Kuhn missed out on all that. And to retrace the steps of those who knew him and, and, and get in on his life and make him real for folks, is always something. And anytime I meet anyone who has anything to contribute as a memory or an insight about Gene Kuhn, I like to do that. And so here we are. It's his 100th birthday, his 100th anniversary of his birth, his centennial. And just so you know, January 7th is his birthday. But back home in Beatrice, Nebraska, Gage County, the Gage County Historical Society, they have a film festival there. There's several people from Beatrice who have been involved in the industry over the years. And you better believe they know about Gene Kuhn, their, their hometown boy, who really moved when he was a kid. But still, you're always born somewhere, and that's your roots, right? Even though he kind of worked around the Midwest before he came back and forth to L.A. as a kid growing up and then finally settled here, right, post-Korean post War. Well, not on the birthday anniversary, probably because it's January in Nebraska, but... This March, if you're in that part of the country, 
March 15th and 16th, the Gage County uh, Historical Society and everybody in Beatrice is going to be having a two-day, 100-year celebration of Gene Coon's birth. They've got details are pending, but just wanting you to know about it. Again, this is, this is south central Nebraska, due south of Lincoln, and just over the line from Kansas. Uh, Beatrice, Gage County is going to be honoring their native son about that time. So, gang, I'm going to call it there. I wanted to mark Gene Coon's anniversary. There's a couple of people that can speak to this, especially just beyond his Star Trek resume that you can read and people talk about. I wanted to get across the feeling this guy is from the heart of the Midwest, where they have not forgotten him, by the way. This guy was a Marine. His dad was an Army sergeant. His mom was a decorator. He was in the 4-H. He, he sang. He was on the radio when he was five singing. He could pronounce and speak French and German, at least enough to sing, sing the lyrics. I mean, if you just go back through that, I mean, just what we know about, there is an autobiography, there is a biography of Gene Kuhn that's out. You can find that. Uh, but any, any ability, any chance we have to have live people give us firsthand memories and insights about Gene Kuhn is amazing because we care because so much of the foundationalness of Star Trek. This is not to knock Gene. Gene got the whole damn thing going and came up with the basic concept, which was amazing. And of course, Gene's overriding vision and moral code is there, even shaped by the time he lived it, both pushing the envelope and not. But here's Gene Kuhn coming and giving the grittiness and the, the humanity of it. A little, there's a little bit of very straight jawed Kirk in the beginning, which may have been what Gene wanted originally, right? A very 60s action hero. And yet, and yet, I can still say, no, I will not kill today, which was a little bit of a revelation at the time. Again, if you're checking out Genealogy on the Roddenberry Network, you should do that. They get into the insights of what was going on with Gene's early writing. Well, Gene, the genes, the two genes, as Dorothy Fontana would say, and we've got Dorothy Fontana on the Trek Files talking about Gene Kuhn as well. We're privileged and thrilled to have Dorothy, I want to say six times before she passed on the Trek Files. And at least half the time we're talking about Gene Kuhn because we can. So I'm going to leave it there. We'll have all those links available. If you're looking, you can find them. But happy 100th birthday on the 7th to Gene Kuhn. And I'm sure you'll be hearing a lot more. Uh, I know a lot of the rest around Trek are going to be talking about Gene Kuhn and his impact. And beyond his impact on Star Trek, the, how it, we got to that point. What was going on with his life? What were his roots and influences? So yes, happy 100th, Gene, and happy new year, everybody. And if you're itching to get out and have an experience in your trek, do it live. Come in with me. I will lead you on the tour that you customize with my help for away team sites around Los Angeles. Okay, maybe landing party. <laughs> and I have to say the Trek Files, it's a Tuesday. And of course we're back. And this week, hey, number one, if you didn't catch last week's, it's Mike McMahon, our 250th episode. We're looking at the animated series and what it meant for, yeah, for Laura Dex. Circusing, circling on the creation of the Cations and Mares. And now we've got to Anna. What does that mean? And Orions and even Tellarites and all kinds of fun stuff. It's a bonus length edition of the Trek Files, number 250, last week's episode. It's awesome. But then again, there's a new routine, regular episode up this week. Tim Gaskell and I look at Gene appealing to fanzine editors for early in-house promotion when everything was so primal in media. Media press? Pop culture media? What is that in 1966? Well, they managed to find it, and Gene is already making sure they know what's going on in keeping Star Trek healthy. Anyway, that's the Trek Files. Find it wherever you get your podcast, And, of course, the paperwork, our paper of the week, the memo, is there on Facebook and on socials, on the social media. Yeah, it's Larry Nemechek on still Twitter X. Also, Threads and the Elephant Mastodon. 
everything else. Larry Novichok's Trek Line. Make sure you like and subscribe here on YouTube, would you please? Uh, also, Instagram and sure, Facebook. And yes, check out portal47.net if you want a deep dive all year long. So it's great to see everybody again. Happy New Year. We'll have an awesome year this year, no matter what it brings. And I am just so appreciative of all you all being here on Tuesdays, spreading the word about Tuesdays Live, about Portal, about the Treks, about everything we do in Trekland. All right. I, there's a new Cadet Alice up last weekend and to commemorate the coming of Prodigy. And we have a couple more to do as well. So again, everybody, thanks so much. Please, 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 you go about your business. Uh, stay healthy out there. There's some surges in COVID and flu. Please take care of yourself. Please do all the things, would you? And yes, stay woke, check the sources, and uh, trek well, everybody. <laughs>